Hello and welcome to this very special interview edition of the Irish Wrestling Podcast. My name, as always, is Mark O'Brien. I'm joined today by one half of the Daddy Boys from What Culture Wrestling, Mr. Michael Hamford. Michael, over there in sunny Newcastle, how are you doing today, sir? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. Sorry, listen, before we get cracking into anything wrestling related or your own history, I want to extend my sincere condolences. Uh, I know you're a huge Sunderland fan. Um, I know it was absolutely gut wrenching loss to Luton a few weeks ago. I'm a Celtic fan, died in the wood Celtic fan. Tony Mowbray yeah. um, played the oh. best foot played the best football I've ever seen in Scotland up till by my big Australian hunky man left me for Tottenham recently. Um, <laughs> he was coaching Hibs, and I've always loved him. He was a Celtic centre back. It didn't work out from a Celtic manager, but uh, I was actually genuinely gutted from. At Sunderland manager recently, so listen, I've no doubt, like Luton, for the novelty in itself, it's hilarious to see Luton in the Premier League just for the ground issues and the size of the town, but yeah. I've no doubt you lads will bounce back next year and Tony will be happy playing the sexiest football in the Championship once again. I thought you were like performing some sort of drive-by there when we come out and discuss wrestling, you hit me straight away I'm with sorry. that. <laughs> and then you mentioned Tony Mowbray and my heart is just fall over again because that's how he makes you feel. Yeah, like, yeah. Those exact sentiments. We had um, a no pressure season, which rarely happens as a Sunderland fan. Yeah. To not be in a relegation battle or particularly any kind of promotion mm. dogfight was quite nice. But then Mowbray Ball was so beautiful to watch that suddenly we were in a promotion dogfight. Yeah. So the playoffs felt like a bonus season this one. Um, and yeah, I share those sentiments. I assumed that we were getting kind of one of those like English manager merry-go-round guys yeah. when he came in. And then my word, what an eye-opening season it's been. I absolutely love that man. And I will defend him, like sort of to anybody that just assumes that he's one of those guys. A very, very, very special man. He's kind. He's generous. He plays unbelievably beautiful football. I saw your tweet a while ago that Tony Mowbray invented football, and I pissed myself laughing for a good half an hour. <laughs> um, but no, listen, yeah, listen. I, I said I'm a Celtic fan, so I'm very much in the same boat as you. It's either extreme highs or extreme lows, and there's nothing yeah. in between. And I don't understand somebody who would support a team that isn't like that. Um, that's just my own yeah. point of view, anyway. But anyway, let's crack on to uh, the weird, wonderful, and wild world of professional wrestling and your own history with it. So, um. I've met, been lucky enough to meet you a couple of times. I met you in Dallas outside um, Monday Night Raw yes. <laughs> after WrestleMania last year and the two of us stood there. So that wasn't as shit as I thought it'd be. Uh, that was actually <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, and then I met you over at the Clash of the Castle What Culture show uh, last year in Cardiff. Maybe give the Irish wrestling crowd, you might be lucky enough to follow your show, follow this show, a bit more about your own background in the media space, how you've kind of gotten to the position you are now as being one of the better takes i would say within the space um or the more honest and not ahead, not getting ahead of themselves in the takes takes from the yeah, space i'm not sure i can tell you how it became one of the better takes because okay. i don't think i am on so like the end um, uh-huh. it's you know it's luck man it's like yeah. uh, like i think there's all sorts of things that you can do um like the wrestling media is obviously bigger and the net is wider than ever before which is just tremendous uh but in terms of i suppose like what's happened but in the last like several years with the What Culture podcast, it does, it just feels like one of those things where we hit upon something where the timing was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, myself and Sidgwick started at What Culture maybe six months apart. Mm-hmm. And then Wilborn started another maybe like six months after that. And he had this radio background. And obviously the What Culture Wrestling YouTube channel was establishing itself as one of the bigger online, um, as was the website. And it was just the fact that we could kind of like take what we had in terms of an existing video and print audience mm-hmm. and try and get a little bit of that on the audio side um, was, again, a, a bit of fortune that there was like something already existed. Like the podcast wasn't particularly one of the bigger ones. And obviously, you know, as you, you yourself will know, there's hundreds of wrestling podcasts out there. So it was mm-hmm. just one of the many, I guess, that just had a certain audience off the back of the video and the website one. And we already did so much work either as writers for the website or then obviously helping produce like th- those articles then became videos on the website, you know? So we were kind of already doing that in the background and it was just this little thing that we were able to carve out for ourselves. Um, it was great really, cause I'd had, well, proper jobs because this isn't one, this is just the dream every day. Like don't, don't be fooled by any of it. This is the dream job. And like, I'd, I'd, there's not a single day that I don't mm. like thank myself and, and remind myself of that. And in every other job I'd sort of ever had, I'd done writing in the background more for pleasure or mm. just to sort of, just to do it, just to kind of keep yeah. my hand in because I was a like a, a journalism graduate that had kind of left the media behind and just got a job and got responsibilities and yeah. had mortgages paying, kids to feed and all that yeah, kind of yeah. thing. 
So like it was very much dream stuff until I was getting made redundant. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, like you take a few more chances, I guess, yeah. when yeah. you're back against the wall. And I was very lucky that what culture was based in Newcastle. And then as I say, meeting Sidgwick and then us getting together with Wilborn and just sitting down to talk about, it sounds a cliche, mm. but to talk about Raw, for example, on microphones yeah. instead of just over our desks. Yeah. And then it just, obviously we, we took something that we kind of already established in the office as a friendship and you know, as, a, as a bond and kind of like, it was, it didn't feel as, ner- like after the first couple at least, it didn't feel as nerve wracking as I would have imagined sitting down in front of that big scary microphone and having to commit your thoughts yeah. to the world. And then, I don't know, that would have been sort of 2017 maybe. Mm-hmm. And I think from there, it was a very, like, all these feel like cliches, like very sort of organic. And it mm-hmm. never really felt like, we, we didn't feel like we were kind of trying to chase audiences or try and come up with gimmicks or just be too grabbing. We would just watch the wrestling and talk about the wrestling. And honestly, like six years on or whatever it is, it doesn't really feel like that has fundamentally changed. It's just weird things like getting guests like Stacks to come in with us. It's just like such yeah, an yeah. honor. And like all the things that have come along with the podcast have only been uh you know part of that like natural growth i guess the longer something goes yeah no listen i mean i've I've been obviously been a follower of your work and what culture for a while now and i think particularly you talked about kind of this being your dream job you miss all the shots you don't take so like fuck it like why not to give it a go um yeah. like this I, I said i was chatting to you last year and i kind of said like how would i get into the space and you said listen just start writing just see what you mm-hmm. do what you enjoy like i work in finance this is a part-time gig for me this is just something i do for creative fulfillment to get to chat to some cool people and um, but at the same time being fully aware the wrestling is weird um and just yeah. enjoying it for what it is whereas a lot of people don't have that perspective but i, I suppose what you guys have done particularly I suppose your own rise with what culture kind of coincided with the likes of all in AEW launching, then also COVID happening at the same time where people had a lot more time in their hands or people like myself are locked in their bedroom, working on a laptop seven days a week. And instead of interacting with people on a daily basis in an office, I've got you guys and Wilborn and Miller in my head, head yeah. your assess, do you know what I mean? And you're listening to your takes on a daily basis. And I might be echoing the same sentiments. I have my phone on my laptop beside my laptop as I'm watching NXT and thinking this is shit and then I like, and, and listening to your review and like yeah that, that's spot on that was shit and then you might be listening to your preview about AEW and then you're kind of geared up for your evening because you don't have a huge amount else to look forward to during those weird and wonderful years at the big yeah. COVID bastard or whatever you guys were calling at the time on the podcast um but yeah listen I suppose you guys did help an awful lot of people and I hope you guys do appreciate that they kind of affect you able to help and kind of the escapism wrestling as a whole but also the co- content you guys are producing on a daily basis back then were providing to a lot of people um point where off the back of COVID then when Clash of the Castle came around last year you had a live show where it was I think I believe it was sold out in Cardiff the room was absolutely jam-packed uh yeah. I was actually I was actually watching Celtic versus Rangers on my phone at the same time as listening to you boys <laughs> Celtic one as well yeah yeah so um but listen, yeah, like what's that been like, I suppose, for yourself coming out of COVID, whereby you just might be hopping on Zoom and chatting shit about wrestling with your friends and then coming mm. out of COVID and meeting people in real life and like, Jesus, we've we've probably really helped people, if that's occurred to you. Well, it's, I mean, it, to be honest, it occurred to us more when we had things like um, like the trips out for WrestleMania or the live meetings, like meetings like the one you discussed there, but the opportunity yeah. to get out and do live shows again. Mm. Um, I think... It, it, when it wasn't obviously when, when it couldn't happen live because of the restrictions and stuff, we kind of noticed that um, we were having a lot more conversations with people on Twitter. Uh, and that was, that's kind of our, I'd say certainly myself and Sidgwick, that's kind of our primary mm-hmm. uh, social media when it comes to pro wrestling. Really, we don't like, I'm not, I've never really been clued up on like Reddit as an active user. I might yeah. use it from a Google search from time to time, but yeah. like then Facebook's not really been a thing for us. So Twitter was always this very like, for all that there are obvious complaints you can have with Twitter, it became quite a good conversational space in the pandemic yeah. and coming out of it. And for so long, you didn't even want to say you were coming out of it because there would be restrictions and then there would be lifted and then there would be new restrictions. So you never wanted to put a finer point on it until you were way, way past it. So it was probably late 2021 when WWE and AEW were back out on the road. And the first got, so like Dallas WrestleMania, like the first conversations of being able to think even about stadium shows coming back again and doing live things in bars and stuff like that it was we said this a lot and it was when we were all back in the studio for the first time and recording again and people were leaving really nice comments on like the video podcast we were doing about Mm -hmm. getting the sales all together like we said this at the time and it it does it sounds a bit like hammy i guess but it was mutually beneficial Mm -hmm. honestly like those work days you know like 
So you would log on as everybody did and you would do your, whatever your work was. So in our case, it would be maybe writing and then we would like get together. And in my insidious case, there was probably like children and very incredibly patient wives downstairs yeah, yeah, yeah. having to do the bulk of the grunt work while the kids were obviously off school. And then in like in Wilborn's case, like his neighbors putting up with all of those voices louder than ever from his spare bedroom. And just, it was, you know, people have said really nice things about like mental health and about yeah. like, just being able to like switch off and listen to us talk bollocks for a couple of hours a day with a couple of different reviews. It was the same for us. Honestly, it was the same for us. Like it's not easy to, um, I, I, I didn't think, I didn't find it easy to adjust to a life of speaking to your family and friends on Zoom calls during mm -hmm. the pandemic, but we had no choice but to get used to it really quickly, mm -hmm. two, three times a day. And it was honestly a lifesaver at times because mm -hmm. watching the wrestling wasn't always a lifesaver. Yeah. It was, with WWE, it was this horrible reminder of just how bad it was. Yeah, yeah. AEW was an escape. Like Dynamite yeah. was amazing, I thought, in the pandemic. But talking about WWE, even when it was rubbish, was just mm -hmm. something. Yeah. And the fact that, like, honestly, it was, the fact that people considered it a help blows my mind, really, mm -hmm. because like believe me it was as much a help for all of us yeah. like it was the closest you kind of felt to like humanity like everyone i always think about this with the pandemic because it feels longer than like two or three years ago doesn't mm. it? it feels like yeah, yeah. a couple of long times ago now and we're all still dealing with the aftermath of it in mm. our own ways I think. But nobody had a good one and I, I did like i did another podcast a cheap plug i'll throw in here now hey. another podcast time um podcast horseman it yeah was I, was about, I was about to mention i was about to mention your co host that without madam nicholas but go on yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, me, and Nick, me and nicholas did that together once a week when we were able to and i say when we were able because it would basically be me because i couldn't do it in the work day because we yeah. were doing work i would yeah. be set up in the kitchen long after my children had gone to bed and my wife and i had had time to have some tea yeah. and it would just be like between say nine o'clock and half ten at night where i was basically frazzled from two yeah. kids full on four of us in a house trying not to yeah, kill yeah. each other and nicholas like lives alone lives a pretty cool life but like is completely alone yeah. and has nobody all day every day and we was yeah. it was quite interesting because i was thinking man I, I can't do this anymore and then he'd be thinking here's my completely different version and i can't do it either let's talk about a horse cartoon for a bit yeah and then it was a yet again it was a release for the both of us and i just i, I feel really lucky that it was that people felt that way. And I like, I would never consider myself like, we always say it, it's great when people say it, but we're not like mental health experts. Yeah, we yeah, just yeah. talk about wrestling. But getting back out to see people and having these, um, these kind of like, almost like catch ups with people, because at this point, like you do develop a relationship with your listeners over several yeah, years. Yeah. Quite emotional, like yeah, genuinely yeah. quite yeah, yeah. emotional. Like, Dallas was everyone's first WrestleMania back. And I think for us to, like, I was really lucky to be on that specific yeah, trip. Yeah. And then Clash coming so soon after that being this historic UK mm. event, as I think like All In will feel later yeah, yeah. this year. Um, well, hopefully that'll be better. Anyway. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> it, it did like the, the meetings with like listeners, yeah. like was mm. genuinely like quite emotional because a lot of people shared those stories yeah. and you always sound like you're kind of, I don't know, you feel like you're one of them kind of cliched wellness hacks when you say, oh yeah, I know it was a big thing for us too, but it genuinely, yeah, genuinely yeah. was. Yeah. No, listen, I, I completely understand that, particularly around Twitter when you're talking about uh, you'd be one of the few people, you're probably in the same boat as me in terms of you watch wrestling at like five in the morning before Sometimes, work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So, and like a lot of the time I'll log on and you're in bed and like you're delirium. It's December, November, and you're like, oh, AW shit, what am I watching this for? And then you go on Twitter <laughs> to give a, a really bad faith take or just a, like a cranky, completely off the wall take. And you look at like, I'll just comment on you and be like, that's bollocks. What are you talking about? Or something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just something like that. And like, yeah. there's only a few people who are online at five in the morning who aren't American and coming up with some American type of take. Mm -hmm. um, so listen, yeah, we'd obviously kind of connect in that way. But you, you kind of touch on All In there um, and kind of the events are coming up this summer. Are you guys going to Money in the Bank or All In or do you have anything planned around those the coming weeks ahead? So we, I believe, will be, I can say this, I think we will be at All In. Um, at the very least, doing our usual slate of coverage. Mm. It might be more than that, but I, like, yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah. know yet, and that's all right. up in the air. But certainly we'll be there doing our coverage. So anyone that kind of catches us, by all means, yeah. come over and say hello, even if it's just in and around yeah, Wembley. Yeah. Um, I'd love it if mm. we could sneak our way into the scrum again, because that's... mine and Sidgwick's first experience that double or nothing went particularly well. It was nice to get some yeah. feedback from the champ on the podcast. Yeah. So I'd, I'd happily have another bite of that one. Um, and yeah, if there was the opportunity to put together a live show, I think we'd love to do it. As nerve-wracking as they are mm. to do, they're yeah. such a blast as well. So like, 
we did like we did the one that you I met you at yeah. in Cardiff, yeah. and then we done like a kind of last minute one the night before in Newport, heard, like yeah. along, and like they were both just so much fun, and yeah. like hopefully we'll be able to do something like that. Uh, Money in the bank, I think. I, again, I like I don't know what I'm like allowed to say or not. I'm hopeful that there mm-hmm. might be like a couple of the guys. Uh, like, I won't be yeah. for this one. Okay. A couple of the guys going out to do some coverage, but I also know we'll be doing a bit more here. Like it's cool to be able to do our live stream at a normal mm-hmm. UK time. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Something yeah. That hopefully, at a bare minimum, we can engage more with our UK audience that yeah. don't have to be up at one yeah, in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, we normally when we do the streams over here, that's like yeah. a night shift for two of us. Yeah. To be able to, like, even if it's just setting the camera up, it's nice to be doing it at seven at night rather mm. than one in the morning. So yeah. there'll be a bare minimum of that. And with any luck, fingers crossed, a couple of guys might be heading down to do a little something as well. Brilliant. Again, you actually touched this in your recent podcast coming back from Vegas, like wrestling being held at five o'clock or seven o'clock is just a completely yeah. different thing. It's just like, oh, this is this is actually okay. I can enjoy it more. And it's a completely yeah. different experience. Like, we kind of, I obviously, us in this part of the world are either watching it like, one in the morning or six in the morning yeah. or something in between and you don't get that whole live experience and the, particularly if I'm, I'm watching WWE I'll watch it on two times speed but that's just me um mm-hmm. just but anyway that's kind of my own appreciation in terms of all in then I was going to ask you this um all in main event um you may agree you may not agree my personal take I think the biggest possible main event for that weekend uh would be Kenny Omega um and a lot of people may disagree with this would be against Jeff Jarrett um, yes. yes, and so that's, just my, that's my take. I think it's his world, it's Jeff Jarrett's world. I've interacted with him recently. He's a lovely, kind, decent man, much like Tony Mowbray. So, listen, I, I, I can only hope for the best for his. I hope Aubrey Edwards gets the boot as soon as possible from all wrestling. <laughs> just deserved. And uh, <laughs> Jeff Jarrett wins everything under the sun in all elite wrestling. Why is that the right call and why am I right? Look, a lot of people like to listen to podcasts um, for like scalding hot takes and yeah, unfortunately yeah, yeah. we're obviously just delivering and sharing a freezing cold one here because yeah. this is obviously the kind of main event that people would have assumed for years right yes of course AW gets, AW gets a stadium question mark big dollar bag with jeff jarrett and kenny yeah, omega yeah. Headline it. it's uh look all joking aside yeah. uh I, I do earnestly love jeff jarrett and yeah. like there's a it's, it's been wonderful to see this last year like so many people come around to the, the benefits mm. of having a jeff jarrett around there is uh, like I'm not pitching Jeff Jarrett and Kenny Omega at a main event all in, but I am pitching I, Jeff Jarrett. I am, and this, but I anyway. yeah. <laughs> them fighting in a singles match, I think is one of those. Kenny Omega is such a special talent, yeah. and Jeff Jarrett is a special talent to me and several others. Mm. That I think, like, I don't think that's that wild a dream match pitch. Yeah. I, like, I remember when CM Punk signed, and straight away you think, right, well, you've got to do Punk Cody, you've got to do Punk Kenny, yeah. but, and then all of a sudden those were gone again. As mm. quick as they were there, they were gone yeah. for a multitude of different reasons. Mm. One day, Jeff Jarrett and Kenny Omega will be gone. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want that opportunity to have been missed just because I want to look at it. I want yeah, to see yeah. how, how yeah. that goes. I want to see Jeff Jarrett cheat and try and mean mug his way out of like eating a V-trigger and a one-wing yes. angel. Oh, oh, oh. Like, yeah, yeah. Just him being suspended in midair with for the one-winged angel, yeah. but having the guitar in his hands and kabonging Kenny Omega in the face. Yeah, yeah. And then do count off it like the, it's I don't think that's as wacky. It's it's both. I understand the ironic love of Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. I feel the earnest love of him. Yeah. Like I, I when he nearly won when he got a couple of times he nearly won the tag team championship. I've legitimately at six in the morning been jumping around my bedroom. Now you've got an yeah. image of Jeff Jarrett on up for one end angel with a um guitar. I've got an image of Karen Jarrett coming in low blow and he's sort of stabbing him with Karen Jarrett's heel. Then much like Ric Flair oh, yeah. leading, yeah. just something like that. Like. 99% of the wrestling audience will hate that, but it's just, I love shenanigans. I love shithousery. I love wrestling for the absurdness. It can be as long as it's good fun and not notional. And people are aware it's weird. But anyway, that's just my I would, I would love a Jeff Jarrett singles match in the UK, yeah. only because I want a full-bodied Brie Woo. Like, you yeah, get, I that's... got, my first one in over a decade was in Vegas for Double or Nothing, having not seen him since, uh, like, a TNA house show. Yeah, in, yeah. Uh, Is it 2009 or 2010? Mm. It's been a long time. It's been a full yeah. decade since I Brie Woo. Yeah. And it was just nice to be uh, worshipping back at the altar of Jeff Jarrett. But it was mixed with the Jay Lethal theme for yeah, their yeah. tag team. Yeah. When you get a singles match and you just get the full undiluted Brie Woo, yeah. oh, that's something else. So to get that at Wembley Stadium with 80,000, well, potentially at yeah. least 65,000 other people, it, it just feel like vindication. Yeah, 100%. Like, I, I, I'm much like yourself. I had seen Jeff Jarrett when he did the TNA House Tour around in Dublin. It was my first ever wrestling show. Yeah. yeah, and it was unbelievable. It was actually the debut of Nick Aldis in oh, TNA right. as well. It was his first ever show. He was as Brutus Magnus, whatever, at the time. Yeah. But uh, you're talking about Jeff Jarrett's team there. Um, 
first to give you credit for inventing the term brie woo. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you've trademarked that yet, but that's kicking around on Twitter. That through yeah. uh, Andrew Dice Clay, who's a, a great Twitter follow, by the way. Okay, I will. I will take that. Yeah, yeah. But like, I, I don't know if that's definitely true, but I love that. Like, I love that. I'm even somebody is suggesting that, that might be yeah. mine. I mean, yeah. if, if you're if you're like Chris Jericho now, you'd be out there going to the patent office, getting that yeah. trademarked everywhere, and making some money off the back of that. But that, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, in all seriousness, no, like obviously this is a funny time of wrestling, a huge summer ahead, and like as tribalistic and as weird as wrestling is, like it's brilliant for us people who watch it, regardless of what it is. Um, obviously. Saturday, you've got Collision. Tonight, you've got Dynamite, which is an interesting show in mm-hmm. itself. You've also then got Forbidden Door the week after. Then you've got um, Money in the Bank. Then you've got Leading to All In. Then you've got All Out. Then you've got Grand Slam. What are your expectations across the board? What are you looking forward to most uh, across any brand of wrestling? It could be North CL up in your part of the way, independent wrestling, because we all love independent wrestling. It could be the return of something as wild and wonderful as What Culture Pro Wrestling. What are your hopes for the summer, Ed? Oddly enough, I've seen what culture pro wrestling trying to be brought back into existence by Joe Hendry and Phil Chambers this afternoon on Twitter. Uh, there must be something in the air there. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, there's a lot like everything you've laid out there. It's like I, I've gone on record before of hating the cliche. Of, it's a great time to be a wrestling fan, yeah, yeah. but over the last couple of years, despite the kind of the booking stuttering by AEW and WWE like always just getting in the way of itself mm-hmm. it has felt like the mainstream product has had like a lot of peaks so like I'm willing to sort of admit that it probably is quite a good time to be a wrestling fan even if you only watch the mainstream stuff which to be fair is most of our coverage and that's most of what I catch like New Japan remains always a bit of a treat attending independent wrestling shows you say is always something that, like I get as a as a rare night out and a rare night off that mm-hmm. kind of thing it's got to be all in though isn't it like, as a UK wrestling fan, it's got to be all in. I'm super excited for Forbidden Door because those two main events yeah, just yeah. out of this world, dream stuff. But all in, like, it's, I think the majority of people, the reason this has sold so well without a single match being mm-hmm. announced, because surely everybody felt, well, I have to be there. Yeah, yeah, Like, the Clash at the Castle, like, was on the verge of capturing it. And I thought there was a very special atmosphere in Cardiff over that weekend. But the ticket prices were high. Yeah. WWE, WWE knew they had a, a big audience that were just there to mm. see the stadium show. Yeah. The card was the card was great. The show was really mm. good, mm. but nothing felt like ultimately I, I think very quickly mm. people came away from that show and felt, oh, this wasn't quite the tribute to Wembley. Like the people that couldn't live Wembley SummerSlam 1992 didn't necessarily yeah. get that feeling at Clash at the Castle. As good as a night as it was. And yeah. I really I'll, I'll fight for Clash at the Castle, but Feels like all ins captured that, and it does. I, I, maybe it's just as literal as the stadium. Maybe that yeah, was yeah. what it was. Maybe, and we hear that WWE had the chance to run it and chose not to. Obviously, Cardiff yeah. paid them quite a bit, and it was a super yeah. successful weekend for WWE in Cardiff. So they just thought better of Wembley. Maybe that was the difference. Yeah, and like AW yeah. captured that, and the fact that it's going to be there. Like Tony Khan said at the last scrum, they're not going to run a dynamite collision in advance of it. So they want all in to be the first. Yeah. So people love being a part of history. Mm-hmm. That's nice too. I'll say this as well, just quickly, because I don't want to sound like I'm a shill for AEW, but something big about this all-in card that I don't think is getting discussed much is that it wasn't just WWE being the market leader that for years made yeah. it seem like the only place to go. After all-in has happened, WWE cannot claim that the only place to ply your trade on a WrestleMania side mm-hmm. stage is WWE. They can't claim that. Yeah. AEW can say, well, look, it might not happen again tomorrow, but we've done it, so we could do it again. If you want to be at the peak of your profession in your industry, here's a pretty good-looking version of it. And I just think people wanting to be – people are buying into that in the very same way they bought into the original All In, just yeah. on a much grander and broader yeah. scale. And I, I, you can't really look past that one for the rest of this year. If you're, if you're on this side of the Atlantic, maybe Americans would think differently, but certainly on this side of the water. Yeah, 100%. Like, I have my own specific take. I wanted to ask Tony Khan the last scrum as well was around um... – Programming and channel choices. So for WWE, they're now in BT Sport. And this is just my own theory as to why Clash of the Castle, aside from price gouging and whatnot, mm-hmm. didn't sell out necessarily. BT Sport's quite an exclusive package. Not everybody has access to it. A lot of people have it. If they want to watch sports in BT Sport, they'll go down to the pub to watch a match. So not everybody yeah. has. Whereas beforehand, we'd have all had Sky One on the Saturday watching uh, SmackDown followed by the bottom line or SmackDown followed by Livewire yeah. when we're growing up, that type of thing. Whereas now you've got 
AEW shown on ITV. It might be on at 10 o'clock at night, but more people have access to it. And the people who are following AEW is generally like a slightly older audience. And those people are probably have slightly more autonomy in terms of making financial and personal decisions based on their age profile. So that's my own personal take as to why, aside from prices obviously related, uh, as to why WWE might not necessarily be considered the market leader over this part, part of the world now. Um, but I'm well, also... TNA tours. We yeah. both at them. Like, the, TNA yeah. was different gravy in this country. Yeah, yeah. And in, in Ireland, in uh, Europe in general. Yeah. It was like, uh, it was where it could have relocated at one point. Such with the with the heat yeah. in the buildings and the attendances and things like that. And again, that was on mm-hmm. various free-to-air services. And it did yeah. make it different back then. Yeah, like, I remember Sunday night watching it on Challenge TV or whatever it was over this yeah. part of the world. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant, followed by WrestleTalk TV. Um... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was brilliant back then. But listen, Michael, you've been hugely generous to your time. Um, just before we wrap up, Brendan, do you have anything specific coming up from any project you have your own, be it the relaunch of BoJack Horseman projects or any <laughs> specific writing coming up in the coming weeks, any interviews dropping, or anything specific we should, people following your own work should be aware of? Do you know what? I have nothing right now to plug other than as we do at the end of every podcast, my own Twitter. Any daft nonsense I get myself entangled with or in trouble with, you'll see yeah, yeah, it on yeah. my Twitter page. I'm at Michael Hamflet. All the links are there. Um, and just uh, honestly, while we're recording, it depends when your listeners catch this, um, we've come up with a pretty cool idea for, we're going to stream the first episode of Collision, the same oh, punk's going to be okay. I don't know if this is an exclusive because we didn't mention this in the news. <laughs> anyway, if, if we didn't mention the news, this is an exclusive for your listeners right yeah. now. We're going to start the stream uh, slightly earlier, around like an hour and a half earlier. And we're going to, me and Andy Murray are going to stream the first Samoa Joe CM Punk match, the full hour. Um, it's on the Ring of Honor YouTube channel, yeah, yeah. and that's going to be our primer for the Collision stream. So anyone that wants to join us watching that, you can do so through their YouTube channel and, of course, through ours. So that's uh, coming up this Saturday. But obviously, if your listeners are listening to this after CM Punk's debut, that's already passed. So just follow me at Michael Hamlet. That's unbelievable. And listen, I'm a 31-year-old man. That sounds far more appealing to me than going on a night out anyway. So I might as well have a few <laughs> beers at home and watch wrestling. So listen, that's absolutely fantastic. Michael, again, thank you hugely, hugely for taking the time for chatting with me today. Um, hopefully, listen, you might be allowed to travel south to be it all in later in the summer if not you've had enough travel already this year so listen i won't feel too sorry for you yeah i think you're doing all right actually listen thanks very much again and listen anybody who's following this please continue to follow michael and all his work with what culture wrestling for uh, follow them youtube spotify amazon music or wherever you get your podcast from for daily wrestling updates there you go yeah i do i listen to things and listen please of course continue to follow irish wrestling entertainment myself foxy and colin jerry and liz for everything more we've got huge amount of coming over the coming weeks so listen michael once more thank you very much all the best, man. Thank you.